This um, book we are studying, the actually we'll be studying the two letters that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. Um, we can see patterns that will also apply for the modern church, today's church. Um, one might read and do not really take notice of certain words that we find in any book of the Bible. And when we think, when we skip those words, we, we, we will miss the actual context of what that particular church or people were going through. In this case, what I have in mind is that this church wasn't established in the middle of a holiday island. This church wasn't started to accommodate tourists that visits a particular tourist area. This church was established to save people from Judaism and paganism. Both cultures, in a way, violent to anything that opposes their ethos. We know now that Paul already suffered this kind of persecution. He ended up in Thessalonica because he ran away from Philippi, started this church, and we find certain words which gives us the picture of the environment that the church was in. And the reason I'm saying this is because if we think a little bit more, we realize that this kind of environment was always present through the church age. Not in every country, but as time goes on, we will be seeing the same kind of persecution and resistance that the church of Thessalonica was experiencing. For example, in chapter 1, verse 6, we find that Paul is commending the church. Remember that this letter is not like the Corinthian letter, rebuking, you know, trying to change their lifestyle, leadership styles were all wrong, Be marriage ideas or philosophy was different. This church was actually a church that was light in darkness. Yes, it had its mistakes, which even Paul addresses, but on the whole, it's a church that he praises for their faith and steadfastness in faith. So in chapter 1, verse 6, he commends them, he praises them, for they received the word in much affliction. 
not little affliction, much affliction. And that word affliction is the Greek klepsis, which means extreme pressure from outside forces. It refers like when you have a pillar that a roof is resting on it, and that pillar is taking the outside pressure. And yet, as we see in the book, in the letters, the Thessalonians, among the afflictions, the eclipses, the outside pressure, they remained faithful to the word of God. The same word was used also in chapter 3, verse 3. And he says to them, he writes to the Thessalonians, that they were established in faith, in faith and that no one will be moved by eclipses, by affliction. Which means that their faith in the word of God, their faith in Jesus, is what they need to remain firm in the consistent opposition that they were experiencing. Why is this important for us today? We may not yet see it around us, but we have already felt its presence that the time will come that we will not be able to speak freely about our faith. And later on, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Yet, before I get there, I want to show you how much this church was suffering. In 1 Thessalonians 2.14, the scripture that uh, Sandro read to us, we find that they were suffering from their own countrymen. That word suffering is pasco, which is the same word used for the suffering of Christ. So now we start to paint a picture before our eyes. We have a church in Thessalonica, an important city, a major city in that area, It was a commercial city. It was a progressive city. And yet this church was there and it was suffering not just outside pressure because of the way they have become different than the rest of the culture, but also they were suffering with a certain intensity which Paul uses the word pasco, which is a picture of the suffering of Jesus Christ. So they were not having it easy. And it's important for us today to know these things because when the time comes and we will be under pressure from outside forces, which mainly would be society, the government, to stop us or to limit us from our religious freedom. This is already happening in many so-called free countries. For example, Not a long time ago, a few, few days ago, maybe a couple of weeks, in Australia, a free country, a church decided to go into a park and have a worship service in the park. We've done that ourselves in the past. 
and the park, you know, you do like this and you cannot see the other side. It's all green and trees and fences and so forth. So if they are praying the guitar and they are worshiping God and they are praying and they are enjoying themselves and suddenly on the video you can see a long line of policemen coming, holding together as if they are going to march against some uh, mob. And they drag these people away to disturb them, despair them, so they will not remain worshiping Jesus in an empty park. No people around them. They were not annoying any neighbors. <clears throat> They were not in front of a mosque. They were not in front of some abortion clinic. They were in a field, in a park, worshiping God. And the Australian police went, armed to their teeth, to disperse a church. We've seen on videos, even in England, a 73-year-old preacher, a grandfather, is preaching from Genesis chapter 1. Someone reported him. He got offended because he read from the Bible that God created man and a woman and made them husband and wife. And this armed policemen go and drag him down and take him to prison. This is in England. This is in London. In Finland, yesterday I saw an article of, it was some court saying to the Finnish government that it is illegal to persecute Bible-believing Christians. In fact, I sent it to the adjust to get confirmation from it. You see, it is happening. And it is around us. And how are we going to behave? How are we going to remain strong in our faith when these things knock on our door? And I have the answer for you, and it is not some ideology. I have the answer that God gave us from this book. I will say it to you soon. But the point is that unless we welcome the Word of God as it is, the Word of God, we will not be strong enough to resist its opposition. In chapter 2, verse 13, Paul's words gives us an understanding of how we should receive the value of the Word of God. You remember during the Bible studies and the last sermons, we spoke about how much Paul valued the Word of God. So verse 16 says, <clears throat> we also constantly give thanks to God for this. That when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word which is at work in you believers. Hallelujah. As I was mentioning Australia, I mentioned Australian and European countries because they are supposedly free countries. <coughs> but we have our sister here from Pakistan. Women raped, ravished, for the simple reason that they are Christians. People killed, pastors burned. She can come up and tell you a whole story of these things. These things happen in a country, and our sisters come from there. But I wanted to make the comparison that the persecution that we will be seeing, and I'm preparing it for you because the Bible prepares us for it as well. It's coming from so-called free countries. So wh what do I have to do? This is the word of God that saved us. 
This is the word of God. That God spoke. It is the same word of God that became man and dwelt among us. This is the word of God which now lives in us. And this is the word of God which helped the Thessalonians to endure affliction, suffering, opposition, and rejection. And the word of God does not change. The word of God remains the same. And if we approach the word of God and receive it as it is, the word of God and not of man, it will give us the same ability that it gave the Thessalonians to resist affliction, suffering, opposition, and rejection. We need to value the word of God Because the word of God is Jesus. When we honor the scripture, and I'm not talking about worshiping the book like the Jews and the Muslims and some other religious do. We appreciate the words written in this book which speak about our Savior. Which speaks about the plan of God for us sinners to save us from our sin and eventually from the fires of hell. We have to choose. The early church in the first and second century suffered persecution from the Romans. Christians were burned. They were thrown into the fire. They were sawn in half. And God knows what type of suffering believers suffered because of their faith. And I ask us this question, are we willing to endure that kind of suffering for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ? What I know is that many believers don't even preach the gospel. What I know is that many believers do not exemplify the life of Jesus here on earth. What I know that many Christians are more interested in worldly things rather than the spiritual things. That I know. What I don't know is how much the church today in the modern free countries, in Pakistan they do, we have the evidence. In Iran they do, we have the evidence. In Egypt we have the evidence. In Iraq, and in Syria, we have the evidence. They are able to resist affliction and persecution and imprisonment and everything. But I am not sure about Maltese Christians. I'm not sure about European Christians. Maybe I had lack faith. But the type of lifestyles that we live does not give the evidence that when the trouble comes, we are going to stand firm in the Lord. And this is a question that every single person, each believer, needs to answer for himself, for herself. Only in our life, only in our heart, we would know that when it comes, we say, come, I'm ready. The poor Christians in China. I just read a report. My dissertation director is a missionary there my goodness me they even put spies in the small home groups so they can spy on who is a christian especially if they are christians not with the permission of the dictator government crosses from the churches crosses of established churches are being taken down Pictures of Jesus, the police come in and remove them and put on the wall, the picture of whatever his name is, the Chinese president. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. And these are all signs of the one world order that is knocking on our door. So how do we become strong? How do we resist 
How do we remain firm in our faith? The answer is value the word of God. How do we value the word of God? We value the word of God with the way we give it its rightful attention. For example, Job. In Job Chapter 23, verse 12. Now remember, Job did not have one page of the Bible. He had no pages of the scripture. But God has his own way of speaking to Job. And Job heard God's voice and we'll have it recorded in the book that was written about him, probably from Moses. And he says at one point, I have esteemed the words of his mouth. And guess what? This was an ultra rich man that has come poor and sick. I hope you keep that in mind. Somebody who was ultra rich. And God tested him. And he became poor. His family died. His wife left him. And his friends were making his life miserable. And yet he remained firm in the words that God spoke to him. And this is what he said. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. What an example. Many of us are at church. And as noon is nearer, what my, our minds go on where restaurants we're going to eat, what I have on the cooker, and, you know, I'm hungry, and so forth. It's a lack of desire of knowing more or sharing more in God's word. Our attention, when it's time, when it is the time of God's word, our attention should be only on God's word. Job gives us the example. <clears throat> the Bible speaks about God's word as food. But more important than our physical food, spiritually speaking, of course. It speaks about bread. It speaks about the word being milk, meat, and honey. Reading each of these verses will give us a, an expansion of our limitation of how important the word of God is. And if I have to choose, I had a long day at work, and I have to go and cook, or do I go to a Bible study? Do I eat a big meal or just take a sandwich for the sake of giving time to the word of God? These are choices which Jesus said and encouraged and taught Seek first, before anything else, the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. So when we come even to make doing a choice of a simple decision, do I have to be, cook a three-course meal and miss church or just have a sandwich and go to church? What decision do you take? Everybody has to answer it for him or herself. Martha and Mary, the word of God visits them. Martha made the decision of dinner can wait. I will go and hear the word. Mary, on the other hand, had the wrong priority. as She said, I better go and cook. And these are principles. These are examples that we need to learn how to apply in our life. Would you rather have God's word than money? Now, that's a tough question. But we find in the Psalms that the word of God was more than important than all riches. The word of God was more important than fine gold. The word of God is more important than great spoil. And again, I go back to the words of Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will come to you. 
Would you rather have God's word than sleep? Oh, I had a long work, time of work. I'm so tired. I don't have time. I don't feel like study. I don't feel like reading the word of God. But of course, you had time to watch Netflix. You had time to watch uh, and play with a game on your mobile. And you um, um, made sure that you post on Facebook and all the other stuff. And yet, you're too tired to study the word of God. Wrong priorities, wrong choices. The word of God is, it is what it is. It is the word of God. Jesus told us, he who has ears, hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. Those who hear the word of God, they also must be doers of the word of God, or else they are deceiving themselves. When we hear the word, we hear it through our ears. But then we must hear it with our heart. And when we hear the word with our heart, we become doers of the word of God and not hearers only. I would like to end, because we are over time, I would like to end with a scripture given to us by Jesus, the word of God himself. And if Jesus said it, I kind of, you know, give it a bit more attention. It's not because the rest of the Bible is not the word of God, but I could imagine Jesus preaching to those Jews there on the mountainside. I can imagine those Jewish people who grew up in a synagogue and had no idea what the word of God is. Why? Because the, their religious leaders had no idea what the word of God is. They taught the principles of man. They, were, they taught the doctrines of man. And because of their tradition, they made the word of God, vo word of God void, useless. That's what Jesus said. So imagine the heart of Jesus trying to make those people go to the Word of God and study it and apply it to their life. And this is found in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24 to 27. And I'm going to read. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Petra. Who claimed was the Petra later on? Jesus. He is the rock. He's not the Petros, he's the Petra. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on Petra. And we know what Jesus is trying to say. The afflictions, the troubles, the opposition, the rejection. When it comes to us, when this hits our country, our families, our personal life, Will we stand firm against it all? My promise to you is you can and you will if you build your life on the word of God. Don't be like the others. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the flood came and the winds blew and the beat and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Where do we stand? Where do we stand? Do we stand on sand or do we stand on the rock, on Jesus, the Petra? And therefore, as we come to end Today, and we next Tuesday, we'll go to the end of this passage, and we'll find something there which is of, of a great 
importance to us is the crown that Paul mentions to the Thessalonians. There are five of them, five different crowns, which we will study next Tuesday in Bible study. Brothers and sisters, don't lose those crowns or don't lose your life and spend the rest of eternity in the fires of hell by being careless with the word of God today. Take it to heart as it is. That's what the Thessalonians did. And they valued that word as being the word of God and not the word of men. God bless you.